Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction. And uh, delighted to be here, and uh, great to see such a crowd. Um, as Paul says, I, I was in India for the first time uh, last week. I spent ten days there, amazing, and I'm off to China next week. And you know, when you call back to home after being in the place place like India, and then as you prepare for China, you just realise how small we are in the world. And a gathering like this can only be thought of by me as kind of a family gathering and just chatting to the locals. So uh, that's going to be my presentation style. I, I'm not sure where I fit in academia or writing papers about the future of e-learning. What I am is definitely a social entrepreneur. Um, I've been lucky enough to spend most of my last 20 years working in tech uh, and, and internet related stuff. I've been lucky enough to work uh, beside some great philanthropists and just see how money can be put into education and... and um, uh, both philanthropically and charitably, but the one thing that has occurred to me over the years uh, in working with philanthropy is that, you know, no no amount of charity and philanthropy is going to change, uh, you know, will change any real need in the world. And the best way to approach it, uh, I decided many years ago, was to create a sustainable, profitable uh, business model to address the need, and that's what I've tried to do in Alison. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get started and. Uh, I was just putting up there um, to reconstitute, and I, uh, I was looking at um, one of the keynote speakers yesterday, uh, yours and struggled, um, talking about reconstituting and looking at the uh, at the um, the definition of it, and it's to build up again from parts. And I, I really do look at education that way. I try not to read academic papers, honestly. I, I just stay away from it. What I try to do is just practically stand stand apart, look at the technologies, and look at the need, and see how can you rearrange these things so that actually it becomes more affordable, more accessible, and more scalable, and much more profound. So I, t I try and do that. I haven't said that I don't ignore academics or anything like that. Uh, the one thing I'd say as well before I start is that Alison is really focused on empowering people in terms of an employment perspective. So I know a lot of you from HE. And yes, we do have a lot of HE courses, but it's, it's more about teaching people basic workplace skills. In, in, in our view, uh, basic workplace skills is the bottom of the pyramid, whereas higher education is a little bit further up. And uh, the, the need for basic workplace skills is in the billions worldwide, whereas higher education is possibly under the billion. And we're interested in billions. And uh, that's where we're going. So it just, uh, I was trying to look for an image about reconstituting, uh, and I, the only thing that occurred to me was, the, um, was Thomas Jefferson's uh, American Constitution, We the People. And uh, so I think someday we're going to just turn it upside down, and that's what we're trying to do with education, is just turn it upside down and look at it differently and, um, and, and move on from there. One, one analogy I often come back to, uh, and some of you have heard me speak or probably heard me say this before, but in, in 1900 in America, 95% uh, of transport was done by horse and car in 1900, 95%. In 1920, 95% was motorized, all right? So in just 20 years, you had a massive, massive change in the transport industry. How many people do you think moved from supplying hay and uh, supplying horses and carriages, do you think, moved into the motor industry? Do you think there was any? The truth is there was none. Right? So in the, in the transport industry, completely changed from one group of suppliers to another. And that's, I think, is something that is highly, has a high potential in education, but not entirely. Education has some sticky factors. But uh, there's going to be enormous change, no question about it, and technology is going to drive that. So, you know, so if we're reconstituting, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, why do we have to reconstitute it? And of course, the problems we're fairly aware of. Um, there's... Uh, the whole issue that it's, it's in terms of loading, it's too slow. Education is, is not educating people quick enough. There's no question about that. It's too shallow. There's too little being taught, and there's too little available to be taught. And then, of course, it's too expensive. So people don't, and then finally, people just don't have access to it. It's a mess, really. Because the truth is, everyone has a natural propensity to want to learn. And what have we been doing in the last couple of hundred years? We've been putting up big costs. We've been putting education behind walls. We've been doling it out if people pay us enough. And that's not good enough. What we need to do is unleash learning entirely. And it's possible with the technologies that, technologies that we have. And it's going to be a lot of fun in doing that too. So I was trying to think of the, the whole word of reconstituting and, 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 and then the whole idea of technology-enhanced learning. And you can think of the technology itself, the, the LMSs and all these different tools. But what I want to bring people onto is what I think of is a higher level uh, application of the opportunities that, that's, that's there. And it's really not the technology, but it's the systems that it enables, the new systems that it enables. And the one bugbear I have in particular is the whole area of accreditation. 
And I, it's not, I guess Bugbear might be a bit harsh. I guess it's the case of opportunity. Accreditation has to become much more informal. It has to become much more dynamic because you're going to f there's going to be an explosion of learning and it's an explosion of quality learning online. And there's no way that we can accredit content the way we used to. It's just way too slow, way too costly. It just can't happen. And what we can't do is, you know, when we think of the education systems of today, we think of the Western system that we all grew up in. But that's just, that maybe might have worked for us, but it doesn't work for developing countries. And you just look at the populations when you come back from the likes of India or you go to China, you just realize we are so tiny. You know, just in Ireland, six million in a country of eight, in a world of eight billion, we just don't register. Nobody in India knows of Ireland, by the way. <laughs> you just ask them, you know, you think what they do. I, I, I talked to one taxi driver and he knew that Ireland beat Pakistan in cricket three years ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the only person who knew anything about Ireland, right? So, yeah, and, and that's not to belittle ourselves. That's fine. We're, we're small and we get around the place. Uh, but at the same time, n not to overfigure our position in the world, we are very, very small. But we can't be imposing our systems of education with others. Um, for those of you who have heard me talk before, one of the fun things I often do in, 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 a, in a room like this is just ask how many people have degrees. So just put up your yeah, hand. Who has degrees? Right? You all, all right, everyone. Puts up your hand. And how many of you, when you were applying for a job the last time, put that degree up there? Okay, on the paper. All right? All the hands. All right. How many of you would like to be tested on that degree right now? <laughs> okay. Can I see some hands, please? No. All right. Fair play to you. Brave, brave woman over there. Okay, the truth is, it's, it, it sounds like a charade, doesn't it? But actually, it was the best system we had once upon a time, it was that we would educate. But today, what does it really mean that you have a degree 20 years ago? It tells you more about the socioeconomic group that you came from. It shows that you had enough discipline to go three, four years in the college. But does it really tell you what you know now? Because that's what an employer wants to know. He wants to know what you know now. And we have the potential to do that. Because the, 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 the mobile phone... The smartphone is the most powerful device that's been known to man. And the two things that are going to change education are, are one, the ubiquity of the internet, and the second thing is the smartphone. If you go around India, there's nearly two phones to every person. And even though there's great poverty there, the last thing that these people will let go of is their phone. You know, and in, in by 2020, it's estimated that 6.1 billion of the world are going to have smartphones. It's a wonderful way to bypass all of the costs and all of the barriers to education that have been there for years. And uh, so we have to think about how do we use these new tools and the fact that we can go direct to the customer, direct to the learner. So, um, and it's not just about technology, it's about changing the mindset. It's about changing our accreditation. Well, we all have very set ideas about accreditation, that there's some institution that tells us that when we, we do a certain amount of learning, that we get a certain paper, and then off we go, and we know bloody well that we all forget it fairly quickly. But it's like we have to change to have a better, sharper system that makes a lot more sense. Okay, so at, at Alison, what we want to do and I guess as I want to do as a social entrepreneur is I want to drive all of the costs to zero. Right, so learning online. Um, maybe you could adjust that. Can, can you adjust that just a little bit over there? Yeah, but um, we want to uh, drive all of the costs to zero. So currently, if you're familiar with Alison, we have a business model that's based on advertising and, and certification. So uh, if you're studying on Alison, there will, you'll be the course will be surrounded by advertising. Um, th there's some good things about advertising. Oh, some people think, of course, that there's no place for education or for advertising education. I disagree profoundly. It has revolutionized TV. It has revolutionized radio. Why can't it be in education? And the truth is it's in education anyway. Ask uh, any, if any of you have kids, they go online all the time and they're surrounded by advertising. Does it really bother them or stop them learning? Not at all. But the fact is, if you apply it in most of the learning, you can make it very much free. And that is golden, because you make it equal, the equal accessibility of it. The other thing that's really cool about the advertising model is that when someone clicks an ad in California on the Allison site, we make probably a dollar. We could make even two dollars in California. In America, it's a very mature advertising market. But if someone clicks it in Zimbabwe, we might make a cent. So the truth is, somebody studying in Ireland, UK, America, Germany, when they click an ad, they pay for about 100 people in the developing world. So there's a lovely uh, way of, of balancing. And the other thing that we do is we charge for certificates, but we don't insist on paying for certificates. So if you pass a course on Alison and you have to pass 80% of the questions, then you're an Alison graduate. You're an Alison graduate right then and there. You don't have to buy a physical parchment to be a graduate, but a lot of people do. A lot of people like to show them to employers, a lot of people like to uh, put them up in the wall, and a lot of people just buy them because they've learned for free on Alison, they just want to support what we do. But you don't have to uh, pay for it, but a lot do, and that 
between all uh, between advertising and certification, we more than pay our bills. And of course, it is an intensely analytical uh, um, procedure. If you, uh, we have nearly forty employees uh, in our in Galway now between. Uh, full-time and part-time. And if you come in, there's more engineers than educationists in the sense it's all analytics, it's watching numbers, it's running platforms, it's working with servers. So it's a, um, it's quite an, uh, it's, a, it's a different environment in terms of going into an education organization than you might expect. So learning is free online through that model. Certification is explained. Learning management. So we have a fr free learning management system on Alison. You can put, take any amount of courses on Alison and you can provide it to thousands of people. You can monitor all of their, tra uh, all of their activity and uh, it's entirely free. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, you look at the, the LMS business that's out there today and it's a 10, 20 billion dollar business. I just don't see it being sustainable, and I'm sorry if you're from Blackboard and get upset with what I'm saying, but I just don't see it. At the end of the day, anything that's digital, anything that's digital will drive the costs, will allow us to drive the cost to zero, because the, the marginal cost of sharing a course that's already produced to another person is next to zero. So that's what we have to keep on doing, driving all the costs to zero. So the fact that you should have free learning, you should have free certification, you should have free learning management. And uh, later this summer, we'll be launching free publishing so that you'll be able to go on the website and you'll be able to publish your course. Now, you won't be able to publish the course just anything. Uh, we have, as I was explaining to Brian earlier, we have upstairs and downstairs in the sense of you want to just publish a course of whatever dynamic and whatever format you want, you can, but you'll be able to distribute it just to your own people. But if you want to be on uh, the 7 million people on Alison currently and you want to provide a course to them, then it, you'll have to do it in the way that we want you to do it. Because in some ways, and not in all ways, but our Alison is like a YouTube. There's no question that YouTube is the biggest learning tool in the world. But the fact is, when you go on it, you don't know who the publisher is. You don't know how long the course is. You don't know what level it's at. So that's something that we do in Alison. We review all the courses. Uh, we should make sure that, it's, that, that people know when they start a certificate that it's a certain length, or a diploma on Alison is a certain length. And uh, we have six people who have master's degrees in pedagogy, and they just review everything in that regard. So that's what we want to do, drive the costs towards zero. So just to say a little bit more about us, that's, uh, we were nine in April, and that's all of us blowing out cans on a very messy cake. The chocolate got all over the table, we won't go into that, but anyway, that's some of us. And uh, so we're in Galway, there's nearly 40 of us, uh, we have 13 nationalities. Uh, we've brought people from all over the world. Um, it's a lot of fun doing it out of Galway. It's nice to live in the west of Ireland and have an international perspective day to day. But it's tough sometimes to get people to come there. So we have people from Brazil, from Croatia, Serbia, all over the world. Um, and who are they? Well, this is just a picture of some of them. And these are people who have done certificates and diplomas and who actually have decided to, to purchase a parchment from us. And we have graduates in every country of the world. And uh, they're growing fairly rapidly. So here's some stats. Uh, we're at 7 million learners now. Um, we're actually probably ab just above it. We're signing up regularly 200,000 people a month and we've been doing that for several years. Um, we're going to do ahead of that this, this month but it might be back again next month. We have about 750 free courses and the, uh, if you're familiar with Alison they're mostly workplaces I said. So anyone, publishers or anyone from Microsoft to Google to Macmillan to private people who are just really really expert at what they do. And what we try to, the courses we try to provide are things like, uh, say, somebody being introduced to, PC, uh, to computing at the first time. They'll tell them what a keyboard and a, and a mouse is, then teach them what Word and Excel is, and then teach them how to build a website, and then teach them how to uh, build a business online. So we're trying to empower people. We're trying to create learning paths in everything that we do, from project management to English. Get people on, on a ladder and keep, keep enhancing their learning and keep bringing it along. Uh, we have 800,000 graduates globally. We're, we graduate 1,300 people a day. So um, I don't know where that puts us in terms of the Irish leagues, but <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, we could be qualified as, I guess, in some ways as the largest educator in Ireland uh, and, and one of the, world, uh, the, the largest in the world. Uh, we're a social enterprise, as I said, in the sense that we are a for-profit company, but what we're trying to do is to make a profit, but at the same time, number one goal is try and make education free. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to do that. Uh, we're founded in 2006. Um, some people say we're the first MOOC. I hate the word. If any of you have any spare time, please get a different word somewhere. Uh, are we as massive? Are we open? Are we online courseware? Yeah, we're probably all of those things. Uh, I don't really care if we're the first MOOC or not, but certainly when we started in 2005, 2006, I didn't see anyone doing anything like this. And um, it was lonely territory until basically Casera started, because people would be saying, oh, who are you like? And then I'd be saying, oh, right. 
I have really nobody to compare us with. But when Coursera came up, even though I don't really think they're very alike, <laughs> I'd say, oh, Coursera, and then they're all happy that there is someone to compare you with. So sometimes it's useful to have a competitor. And as I said, we're Galway-based, even though uh, I'm on plane a lot, and we're quite international. Uh, one of the fun things is, like, I was, I was in India last week. I'd never been to India before, but I was there to announce that we had a million learners in uh, India. And isn't it crazy that uh, an organization from the west of Ireland can have a million learners in India without ever going there? And, uh, you know, when I was there, I met with the Minister of Skills, I met with the head of the National Skills Development Council, and it's remarkable how open they are, because they have an absolutely massive requirement there. Their Prime Minister has said that they want to train 500 million people by 2020. Imagine, 500 million, and they think we have problems in this country. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite a challenge, and there's no way that they can do it without embracing the type of uh, solutions that we're bringing. So I guess the, the thing is, they said themselves, if Alice can, can get a million people online without even talking to government, what can we do by working with them? So that's going to be interesting, and I'll be back there again next month. Um, and you can see the density of our, our country. You know, one thing that's important to us is, uh, you can see that the dark blue places, like, so there's, if you understand Google, that means that there was 15.250 uh, million uh, visits to our website in, in America. So that's the top country we have. Uh, what we try to do is make our courses competitive in developed countries, right? Because they need to be competitive here. Uh, if they're competitive here, they'll definitely be competitive in the developing world. But it's important that we have a lot of traffic in countries such as the US and UK and, and, and the likes of Ireland. But just to give you an idea of Ireland, would you believe the advertising yield in some place like Nigeria and Ghana is higher than Ireland? Right? If someone clicks an ad in Nigeria, you make more money than some, some, excuse me, someone clicks an ad in, in Ireland. And this just tells you just where you know, Africa wasn't that way. Five years ago, someone clicks an ad in, in, in Nigeria, you might make 10 cents. Today, you might make a dollar. So it just tells you, Africa is just amazing. And then every morning, I, uh, we have nice dashboards that show us learners coming online the platform every day, and you see the world coming, you know, waking up. And, and you, d you notice different trends. Uh, in India, they definitely want to be certified, and they're less interested in the knowledge. They just want their piece of paper. Whereas in Africa, it's incredible. They just study everything we send them, just because they've had no access to uh, education. And once they have access, they're really, really excited by it. And, and, and that, very, that just simple principle gets me excited about Africa and its potential, the interest in learning and upskilling in every way. Okay, so again, just going back to how Alison works. So you go on, you do a course, self-paced, everything is self-paced. Then you do an assessment. But the fact is, it's, it's tough having an Alison certificate because if you write it down on your CV or your resume and you go into an employer, literally, that person can just test you and say, okay, you have a diploma in project management from Alison, great. Turn over here, go onto the PC and I'll give you a quick flash test. And it's just like typing years ago, 30 years ago, if you went into an interview and you said, oh, I can type 50 words per minute, they'd say, great, <laughs> sit down there and type, right? And, and there's no way getting it. And, and the same with any course. And of course, what's different is that there's a bank of questions that are absolutely specific to what you want to test somebody on. And they're there just waiting for somebody to give them to you. So, you know, you see people with lists of Allison courses, but, you know, again, employers increasingly just testing people on the flat, on the go. And if you're sitting in a park and somebody starts telling you that they're a chem chemical engineer, yeah, just say, ah, oh, I don't trust you here. Give them the, the iPhone and give them a quick test on chemical engineering. You can literally do that. Obviously, that's an extreme, but this is how it works. So then unleashing certification. And I think that this is one of the fundamental concepts that's going to change education is the fact that you can, uh, that says anyone, anywhere, anytime, any, any place. So you can. You, you know, we all understand that. But people forget that, okay, you can teach people anything, anywhere, anytime, but can you, you can also test somebody anything, anywhere, anytime. And that really brings the learning outside of physical buildings. And it has real deep repercussions. And then the whole point that the PCs and the laptops and the smartphone in particular are really, the, the smartphone in particular is really, really developing. And they're becoming much cheaper and again, more sophisticated. So you're genuinely gonna be able to use, uh, be able to test people on the go, any place, anytime. So free learning management systems. So um, I don't know sure if anybody here has actually uh, worked with a, a, an Allison LMS. Anyone here out of an Allison LMS? No. Okay. Go, go test it. Um, it's, a, it's getting an upgrade in, uh, this month, but it's, um, you can, as I was saying, you can put on any amount of people on it. And uh, again, if you, you, when you put on people, it's, uh, there will be advertising around the course where you want to take that off, then uh, you pay a subscription. 
Um, if you want certification embedded with the, with the group, you can, um, again, you can pay for the service. So what we do is all the, all, anything that's need to have on Alison is free. Anything that's nice to have, you pay. So that's kind of our, our overriding principle. That's what we try to do. Okay, and then as you, you just can see the, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with LMSs and the whole point of, you know, did they start, did they get the invitation, how far they got, what did they get right, what did they get wrong. All of this stuff is just digital code. It can be free. It should be free. And this is only the beginning. So it's going to get increasingly sophisticated. So, uh, um, and, and what it opens up potential, for instance, and it's like something that I'm talking to the Indian government about. Can you imagine if you had free courses online and you could make it mandatory for any business, say over 500 employees, to mandatorily make sure that all of your, all of your staff had done a particular health and safety course? Or, you know, you can actually do that because now you can give the free learning to everybody and also you can give every company a free le uh, learning management system. There's absolutely no excuse for them not to give training to their people. And uh, can you, you know, think of the workforce? India is going to have 17% of the world's workforce by 2020. Imagine that, you know? But you can make sure that they all have a basic level of training. That can be insisted upon in Ireland as well. Why not? Government has a big role to pay here. And the fact that it doesn't necessarily cost them anything. I mean, that's what's been holding back a lot of innovation is the cost that it, may, it is to impose certain educational requirements on people. But what if the education is free? What if the learning's free? What if the certification is free? What if the tools to administer the education is free? Why wouldn't you do it? And why wouldn't you insist that people do it? Because it definitely has a very, very positive um, public good behind it. So, um, so then publishing. We're having a lot of fun uh, down in Galway at the moment. We're creating universal standards on everything. And uh, essentially looking at any course and figuring it out, how, how, where does it fit? Is it academic? Is it workplace oriented? Is it personal development? And then looking at, at levels. And that's just a, a, a basic sketch of what we're doing. So you'll be able to go on and you'll be able to put, on your, uh, put in your text and put in your videos and put in your, uh, uh, your pictures of whatever kind. You have to do it in a particular way, of course, because we have to standardize this and it, we need to make sure it's of a particular quality. Um, but we hope that it's going to be an experience of something like a PowerPoint on steroids and it'll be all free. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So that's coming out around August, September. When I started Alison in 2005, I actually started with this sketch and I'm saying this is what we need to do. We need to make, create a platform that allows people to create courses for free and put them on. But it's actually taken me 10 year, nearly 10 years to get there. Uh, Alison starting off, had, we had one, one engineer for five years <laughs> yeah, because we couldn't afford any more. We now have a team of 20. And it's amazing what you can do with 20 versus one. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a model of scale as well. It took us five years to get to our first million people online. It took us another year to get to our second million. So it just, uh, and, th and then it, grow it grows from there. The other thing as well is that uh, the model itself didn't really kick in until we had at least 200 courses online. Because people study a course, but they need a second course, and they need a third course, and if you don't have it, they're not going to come back. So there's, there's Alison is a scalable model. It doesn't work if you have small numbers of people, but it works well if you have millions on it. And it'll work hopefully all the better as tens of millions goes on it. So that's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, for any of you who are subject matter experts in anything, or that you, any of you that really enjoy playing with content tools, and you think that you'd, you can make, be a publisher in Alison, please keep an eye on it. Uh, we've gone through Alpha, we're in the middle of a, bel a belt, uh, beta release right now, and it'll be out in August. And uh, the other thing as well is that, uh, it's not that well known, I think, uh, is that publishers in Alison make money, because we, we literally have the revenue that we make on courses. And some people make a lot of money on Alison courses. And you think it's, it might be only a cent or two from each learner, but you, if you have millions of people on the platform, again, the, 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 the amount of money adds up. So we share the advertising revenue, we share the certification revenue. So if you know, if anybody who knows anything and wants to make something of it, you know, um, you can make money out of it. And, and think of it, if you're a beekeeper or you're, you, know, you have some very obscure interest, but you are an expert, then do a course in it. Because um, I used to actually use the example of butterfly metamorphosis 10 years ago. I have it still in my slides. And I, I had read an article that 20,000 people are really into butterflies. Well, that sounds very, very small. But to those 20,000 people, would they do a 101, 102, 103 course on butterflies? Yeah, they might. Yeah, and if you were the expert on it. And one of the fun things about uh, advertising yield and using advertising as a model 
is that um, you know the, the more the more specific the the subject is, then the more specific the advertising that's going to go around it. And if it's specific advertising, it has a higher yield. If you click it, it's going to could be two quid a, a click, could be three quid a click. There's some stuff in medical that you can is sixty quid a, a click currently. Would you believe that? Um, you know that's. Some of it's legal, some of it's uh, disease related. So um, advertising is an interesting way to use all of this and publishers can make money. So of all of what we're doing, the, what, what really occurs to me is that, you know, we, we've been stopping people learning. Um, the first thing, besides, we'll talk about the marginalized first, is just uh, when you have free learning, it's, you know, it's amazing who gets to use it. So people in hospitals, and we, hear, we get letters in, from people all over the world, people in hospital re recovering from, from illness, they have very little to do, they're stuck in bed, give them a laptop, they can prepare for the day that they're going to be healthy. Mentally it's really important for them. They're disabled and they can't get out of work, they might be very sharp but they find mobility a problem, they can learn online. If someone getting back to work, someone, a mom who's been at home and has had kids for a couple of years and then wants to get out back into the workplace, they want to retrain. And it's not just about the retraining, it's getting the confidence. And that's a big thing about online learning and free learning. Uh, we did a survey some years ago, and uh, to, we sent it out to several million people, but 40,000 people answered 17 questions, so statistically pretty good. And 88% of our graduates, 88% said that finishing a free course on Alison had improved their confidence. And isn't that what we want in society? We want people to be affirming their own self-worth, to becoming more self-assured. It's really, really important. And it's a dynamic that we've actually been holding back from people because people like to learn and they get confident from it. Then another statistic that was really interesting, I thought socially, was that 90% of people who did a course wanted to learn further, who felt that they wanted to learn further. So, and that's not just to, to go on to Alison again and do another course. That's about maybe they've done three or four psychology courses on Alison and decide, you know what, this is something I really want to study. I'm going to do a degree on it. I'm going to go to a traditional bricks and mortar college because I think I really want to study this. So it's a great way of introducing people to learning without a cost. And, you know, people talk about completion rates. And uh, anytime you hear people talk about completion rates relating to MOOCs or the likes of us or anyone else, just listen, to, just recall who's talking, right? Because there's a big status quo in education. The completion rates are not as bad as they're, as they're made out to be. Because the fact is, if a, if a platform is free, people are going to go in and have a look. And if you count everyone that comes in and have a look as a, as, as a learner, then your stats are going to be daft. That's like saying that every one of us who goes into a shop and looks around as a customer. Well, that's ludicrous. Right, that doesn't make any sense. So when you look at these stats for completion rates, you at least, at least need to have, uh, be looking at people that are at least 10 minutes into the course. And that's what we do. And when you look at people and you take the stats from there, then the completion rates are up into the 30s and 40% for business courses. And sometimes they're lower, but they're into the 20s, <coughs> 30s plus. So, and you, you look at those figures and you say, and the fact is that it's free, you know, it's, it's quite profound. So, and then the many, you know, we've just been holding back education from everyone. Education should be free, and it will be free, because it's possible to do that. And the business models are profitable and scalable behind it. So there's, it's, it's absolutely inevitable. Okay, so I was in India, and I just want to tell a couple of stories about India. And these five people came to talk to me. So when I was going to India, what I wanted to do was to, to invite learners and to video them. So we hired a camera crew when we set up in a nice hotel in, in Delhi and then in Mumbai. And uh, so I got a real surprise. Uh, six people uh, arrived in both locations. And in Delhi, four of the six had flown in to meet me. And we weren't underwriting the costs. They were just excited to meet me and to come, came to thank me. And one man, this chap who's Amish, the teacher, was 16 hours in a bus to come to see me. And he, had, he came and he said, I come for two reasons. Thanks, number one, because we've been using Alison in our school, teaching kids chemistry and biology and math for the last four years. And without it, we, co we couldn't operate. And also the, 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 uh, the academic achievement of the kids has really zoomed since I've been able to use the platform. So he just said, thank you. And then the second thing is, he says, you have to be part of Skills India, which is the government initiative. And he just wanted to come and uh, encourage me to become involved in that. And of course, that's why I was there pretty much anyway. But it was just really nice that someone would spend 16 hours in a bus, very embarrassing, very humbling. 
the other uh, four people have had come had different stories. So just to give you a sense of how people are using Alison, I'll just go through them. So Kushal came to me, and he's been studying Python and uh, and Alison, uh, the computer programming. And he, he surprised me. He says, you know, I am the best programmer in my class, which Indian people usually aren't so forceful. And he says, I tell you why, because I've been doing, I've been listening to my professor, I've been studying hard, but I've also been doing courses on Python and uh, on Alison to complement my learning. And you find that comp- people being studying Alison as a complement. You know, we don't have to be the alternative. We can just be a complement to other courses to remind you to fortify what you're learning in a paid environment. And as we get stronger, we may someday be an alternative in more and more cases. But uh, so that's what his story was. And uh, he came up from Lucknow. This gentleman here um, came up from Chennai. And he was actually, he's an engineer. And he was very well educated. He's a cyber security um, uh, c- consultant. And, uh, you know, good professional job. He came up just to say that I got, I got a job because I did a diploma in project management and a promotional opportunity came up in the business and I had a project management uh, diploma from Alison and the others didn't and I got the position. So I just came up to thank you for the promotion. So that was really nice. <laughs> um, uh, Piyush, the guy, the entrepreneur, uh, his family have a manufacturing business and he did some of the supply uh, manufacturing courses on Allison. And he said, you know, it was the first form of learning that he ever did that related to the family business. He's due to take it over in two or three years. He's really interested in studying. So he came up and had a, a beautiful gift uh, for me, which is really nice. And then this man, uh, the Sikh chap, uh, his pr- uh, Dr. Boone, he's an employer. He's, I met him in Mumbai. And uh, he had... Um, he was putting 750 people in his business uh, on Allison. And I was excited to find him because I like the stories of employers, because, of course, employers is numbers and that we make money out of mon- num- employers. So that's great. And I definitely wanted him on camera. And he says, but he warned me, he says, My- Mike, you see, you guys don't understand India. He says, Western management is all about consensus, about getting everyone to agree that certain, a certain path is forward. But in India, you just have to tell people what to do. Right? So I said, oh, yeah. And, and I know that and many of you have experience with India. It is a little bit li- like that. But we had a laugh about it, and, and in he went to, uh, to, ta- to do his interview. Uh, and I reminded him, you know, definitely get this employer bit out on, on the video because I, I need it. <laughs> so he came out with a big smile on him. And he says, uh, I says, what happened? Something happened. And he says, yeah. Well, he says, I, I, I answered all the questions that you asked me. And then I got onto the employer bit, and I started talking as an employer. And immediately the cameraman said, "Hold oh, no, 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 no. I was given a list of questions that you were to answer, and there's none here on being an employer, so please do not talk about being an employer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just cultural challenges of dealing with uh, in, in India. But um, just Im- the, the amazing opportunity in places like India. Is, and it's just, uh, there are stories like this right across the world. Uh, and we are very spoiled here in Ireland having the educational opportunities that we have and that it's, fun, it's sponsored by government to a large extent. Um, but in most countries in the world, they don't have this opportunity. And then again, just think of the size, 8 billion people versus our 6 million here. And the Western world is actually quite small. Uh, so most of the world are like people like these. Um, okay, then we do some fun stuff. This is a guy. We did the first kind of MOOCs in, in, in Kurdistan. So we partnered with, a, uh, with the university in Erbil in a war zone in northern Iraq. Uh, it was the initiative was funded by the USAID, and we're working with USAID across the world now. We're working in uh, Central America on on a big project there, uh, which is really going to lead our Spanish language version. Um, but this it was remarkable how these people take hope from being able to access online in a war zone uh, courses that we actually transfer uh, translated into Arabic and to into Kurdish into Kurdish. Uh, that was fun. And then some of you might have seen in the paper this this picture. Uh, one thing I've been, uh, it's been uh, an area of interest for, for me, of, of mine for many years, is just people that are incarcerated, uh, wherever they are around the world, have very little opportunity when they come out. Because there's nothing that really that changes their mind, nothing that changes their skill sets. And, uh, you know, what are they going to do when they come back out if the only thing that they know and how to profit in life is actually true crime or to do things that we don't want them to do? So we, we've, got to, we've got to look more creatively at this. And free learning is, is a phenomenal 
opportunity here. So about a year ago, I started a program in Washington, and I got, gathered a lot of people who were involved in this whole area. Actually, I met an African-American lady who was a lecturer at Howard University in D.C., and we met at Union Station over a coffee, and she was telling me she was from the Bronx, and she was the only person in her family that had got uh, done anyways well in life, and all, she had a huge number of relatives uh, that were incarcerated. And I just left that conversation, and I just said, you know, I've been wanting to do things, something on this for ages. I should do something. So I, I got back to the hotel, and I just started sending emails to the head of education at several st U.S. states and to the federal government, and no one responded to me except one guy. And he was the one guy that I did definitely want to respond to me, and that was the head of educa correctional education at the Department of Education, a guy called John Linton. So he got on to me, and he said... Uh, you should talk to a certain consultant that we work with. And he came on board. And uh, so what, what I was trying to do from the beginning of that program was to find a judge in America that instead of sentencing somebody to jail or instead of sentencing them to do community service, would sentence them to do an Allison course. <laughs> right? And uh, I know it sounds humorous. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it depends what course it is, but, <laughs> uh, but anyway, in February, lo and behold, Judge William J. Watson in the 8th Dis Judicial District of New York, that's him sitting at the back, was in drug court. And this is drug court in a place called Lockport, New York. Now, I don't know if any of you have been ever to, to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, very impressive, but Lockport is about 20 miles away. It is incredible. It's just Boonville. It is absolutely ignored part of the world. Um, there's, it's full of Irish immigrants that went out there to build the, Irish, the, 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 the Erie Canal 200 years ago. I had a, a humorous uh, event where I went into a, a restaurant called Seamus's, right? The, even the Galway girl was playing when I walked in, right? And I said to the maitre d' and I was only joking, I says, oh, well, a real Irishman must get a 10% discount here. And she said, yeah. And anyway, I just, even the way she answered me was, I thought that was odd. Anyway, I went through the whole meal and I left there without, without them believing that I was from Ireland because they'd never met anyone from Ireland before. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I should have sang the Galway Girl for her. But anyway, that wouldn't even have done. But that's how re uh, remote it is. But it, it, these parts of America have a tough situation. This man was, uh, this is Dylan, and he was drug dealing. He shouldn't have been. And uh, so he was heading off to jail. It was his second offence. So the judge, again, is sympathetic to these people and saying, look, all right, instead of sending you to, to, to jail or sending you to do 200 hours of community service, I'm going to insist that you do a course. Now, what he can, under US law, you can't insist that they complete the course or graduate because that has to do about ability and you can't do that. So what he did was he sentenced him to 20 hours of study on Allison. So he could pick, and he said, you can pick it yourself. So he actually he did a diploma in customer service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm glad you got the irony of that. <laughs> Yeah. So, but Dylan said to me that um, his brother had a landscaping business and that suddenly he, was st he, he had left school in secondary school, in high school, and that suddenly that he, he realised that, God, there's stuff that he could learn. And he really got into it. And um, that's him studying. So what he, what he was told was to, um, in, Amer in America there isn't the likes of FOSS or the, the kind of infrastructure the government uh, ha have here, or I know FOSS is, is, is well gone now, but that type of inf infrastructure. But in America, what you have is, uh, certainly it's by law, every library has to make sure that there's free access to anyone in the community. And then there's faith, a lot of faith-based organizations. So in, nearly every community has a faith-based, run by some church or, or other. And, and, and this is one of them. So essentially, the judge told him to go off. In February, he told him, off, uh, told him to go off and study it. And then on March 1st, he came back. And uh, then I rang up the judge and, uh, and I said, look, if, if he's coming back in court, I'm going, to I'm going to be there in court. And there's nothing like turning up. Because I knew that if I turned up, the judge would be chasing this guy to actually study <laughs> and that I'd have a good PR story at the very least and to start the whole momentum. And uh, so anyway, I was in court on March 1st and lo and behold, Dylan stood up and there was, uh, we were, there was a, a chap from the faith-based organization that was able to stand up and said, yes, Dylan had studied this and uh, he had completed what the judge had asked him and he didn't go to jail. So since that, 
Uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, it has uh, now 11 people have been sentenced in the same way because the judges are finding that because community service is so useless, because even in Ireland, the same case, you send people out in community service and they come back in and say, oh, I didn't do it, oh, the ma was sick or something like that. And there's nothing that you can really do. But actually, if they're learning, you're changing their mind and you're doing something useful. So this is the beginning of a programme. And uh, yesterday, uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, this is on upstate New York, so a judge in Minnesota uh, sentenced somebody to a court. So this is all at a low level. This is a drug court and whatever. But I'll make a, a point that's at a higher level. When somebody is sentenced in court, it doesn't matter what, what crime they've committed or what misdemeanor or whatever it is. There should be an accompanying educational element. If you should understand the impact of what you did. You should understand why you shouldn't be doing this, and you should understand why you shouldn't be doing it again, and, 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 and a better understanding so that you make sure that the person doesn't do it again. Do it again. Now, the fact is that judges uh, in the past haven't been able to impose an education sentence because if they did, it would usually mean that the kid had to go back, or whoever had to go down to a college and do the course, and then the state would have to pay for it. Well, they just not limited, less, uh, there's not limitless funds in America, nor in Ireland, or wherever. But what if it's free? What if it's free? Then there's no cost in the state. Then on the other side, there's usually a problem that the defendant has no money because often the people in court are of limited means. But what again if it's free? And what again if they can go into a library and it's absolutely going to be uh, available to them that they can study this course? So the whole idea that free learning, free learning is going to, in my view, has to become part of the justice system around the world. But we had to start it somewhere. And in New York is this. So I guess I tell this story only in that I want you to think differently about how education can be used. If education can be free, and it can be accessed, and, and you can test for free as well, then you can use it for all sorts of innovative things. Another one that uh, I've talked about before is just simple diseases. The, when, whether it's Zika virus or whatever virus it is, if a virus is understood, it, it is made known, and people under, it, see that it's, it's, it's growing on a Thursday, experts can get together on the Thursday and figure out if they can how you can avoid it, uh, particularly for swine flu, flu, there was issues with relation to children in particular. You can, I, it, those issues were identified very quickly. Get the experts together, get a couple of e-learning people around them. You can create a course. It could be 15, 20 minutes. The next morning, you had every, every, con every kid in the country could go through their, their lab at school and complete the course and get a certificate. And then every child in the country could come back to their mom and dad that evening and say, hey, I know how to avoid this. Or at least I know how to, to, uh, to, you know, to um, mitigate the, the potential risk to me. So that's just whether it's, it's, it's providing education relating to health or whether the justice system, education can be new, used in very new and innovative ways. So a couple of things to remember. Uh, highly political. Education is highly political because it controls minds. Politicians are always afraid of who, what, who's educating who. Are they, are, what, what ideas are they putting in their head? And of course, we all know that from the religious to pol politicians have always tried to, to control education. A little bit different here where, where we're just letting it loose and it's a bunch of technologists saying, hey, look what we can do. And uh, so it's, education has always been very national. But the fact is that um, education is breaking the boundaries. You know, the likes of Alison is completely agnostic to what nationality you have. And in fact, there is a vacuum worldwide for, na for international standards on stuff. You know, every country, Ireland, US, France, they all have different standards and everything. But the truth is, once it's in different languages, the content should be the same. It should be 101, 102, 103 on the same thing. And that's what we want to do, just create universal standards on everything. Um, and, and the funny thing is nobody has really a mandate to do that, except, uh, and, and neither way have a mandate, but we can see the social impact that we could have if we do it. Uh, one quick story I'll tell you about is, um, you know, we launched a, a leaving certificate course. My, my daughter was doing the leaving a couple of years ago, and I was amazed at how many, uh, nearly every kid in the class was going doing grinds in, in, for maths, and how expensive it was, and how expensive it was in particular for some families that really, really couldn't, under, uh, couldn't uh, afford it. So I approached Macmillan in the, US, in the UK, and we created 350 videos, really good ones, and some of you probably have seen this, and we just went to all of the maths for junior cert, higher and lower, leaving cert, higher and lower, and then for college, uh, higher and lower, because of the massive dropout rate in college, mainly to do with maths, and particularly probability and, uh, uh, probability and statistics. And we provided it free, and we were launching it. So I asked Enda Kenny, would he launch it? And he said he would. He got two letters from the Department of Education telling him he shouldn't do that, <laughs> right? And I, we were providing it for free, and it cost me about 20,000 to put it together. And I was just doing it because I wanted to help uh, kids. 
And they wrote to him and said, you can't do that because Alison is an accredited provider in the Irish state. Right? Now, Enda Kenny, and I'd be a supporter of Enda Kenny generally, uh, he told him to get lost, and he just went ahead and did it. But that's the sort of bullshit that you have to put up with. Imagine writing to someone saying that you shouldn't be doing this when the, obvious, the, 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 the benefit is quite so obvious. Um, it's a $4 trillion business. So a lot of people make their living out of education the way it is today. So it ain't going to change. A lot of people are going to hold their ground. Just because you can do it a different way doesn't mean that people are going to jump to do it because they, their livelihoods might be tra threatened by it. So uh, you need to worry about that. The incumbents, a lot of the incumbents are not going to be able to embrace the future. That's what, going back to the motor car example that I was saying, that's, I believe, very, very true. And um, the old players just need to figure out what, what do they uniquely provide. And most colleges, well, you know, leading colleges uh, through brand names alone, there's always going to be a, a, a place for them. But lower level colleges, particularly like community college level in America, if you're familiar with it, they're, you know, how are they going to compete? All of the early stuff that they do, certificates and diplomas are going to be free online. So the only thing that they compete on is being local. So sometimes when you're doing a chemistry course, you have to go on and do the chem you have to go into the lab sometimes. So that's the sort of stuff that you have to be providing. And um, or else that you'd really, really focus in an area of research. But most companies can't do that. It's, most colleges can't do that. So I see a, a big demise of, uh, of uh, second rate in uh, educational institutes. And I, I think there's an analogy to the music industry. This is the music industry uh, from 2000 to 2014. And you can see this is revenue for music, right? So the, the, the amount of money collected are, you know, from the industry declined in 2000 from, you know, I don't know, 14, down to even half that in, uh, in 2014 from 2000. And I think the current education system is going to be pretty much like that. Uh, now... Consequently, if some of you know the music industry, the consumption of music has gone way, way up, right? Because it's a lot of it's free, right? But the revenue is going to go down. And I think that this is something that the universities and colleges are going to be facing with, is if they stay the same, they're going to be dealing with declining revenues. But at the same time, there's going to be a bigger, as more people go into the education system, then more people will be going on to doing masters, more people will be going on to do PhDs, and that's where they need to focus. But the lower level stuff, you can't compete in it, you might as well put it online for free and be the first to do it so that you, you make a name for yourself. All right, getting to the, to the end. What can governments do? How can we change people's mindset to embrace free learning because it has such a social, uh, potential social impact? Well, it's fairly obvious, and I'm sorry that's uh, a little jagged there, but the hiring and promotion process. Any government should just simply make it mandatory that when you're hiring somebody within government, that you ask, that you definitely have a question in, uh, for the candidate, but what informal learning have you done lately? So it tells you what free, on free online course have you done? You know, are, are, and what does it tell about a person? It says you're curious. It tells that you're, you want to remain competitive, particularly people who are getting to the end of their career. Some people in, the, in their 50s and 60s find it hard to get a job. But what if you go into an employer and you say, but, but I'm still learning, and look what I've learned. And I'm, I'm, I'm eager, and I'm willing to actually upskill myself in my own time, not just on your, uh, on, your, on your dollar. And I'll continue to do that as I work for you. So it's important the government can impose can, can, can change, uh, can start uh, integrating um, the whole area of informal learning and free online learning into the system by simply just changing, the, changing how the interview process works. And then the second step is, of course, when you get to, to promotions internally, that then it becomes an issue again. You ask somebody who's been working in the civil service for, for whatever and saying, all right, what courses have you done online? It's open to you. Do you not have an interest in, becoming, uh, in, in retaining your skills? And it's not just that you did your CPD hours, because everybody's going to do them. What have you done extra? Why are you ahead of the next guy? You know, and that's that's what free online learning uh, provides you with. One of the chaps I met in India just came and he said, "Look, I was trying to go for a position, and there was two guys with a degree. We both had the same degrees, both same level, but I had done an additional diploma on Allison, and I got the job." So again, it's a way of getting extra competitive. And then, of course, if it works within government, why shouldn't the government make it mandatory and go back to the point that I was saying earlier in India? If there's this amount of free learning online, and if we align courses to the national curriculum, which is relatively easy to do, why can't a government in India or anywhere else then impose on every, on every, every company of a certain size that they make sure that, that there's a certain level of learning that's, that's happening within the, their organization? It can be done, and it doesn't cost the government anything. And for sure, those organizations are going to get it back in product productivity gains. So, last couple of slides. Am I okay on time? Getting, okay. So, what's the future? Learning for everyone. 
learn anything, anywhere, anytime. Universal certification on everything. Learning management for every organization, and it'll be free. And publishing, everyone sharing what they know with everyone else, and driven by an economic model that encourages them because they make money by doing so. And the last slide. So where are we in all of this? Well, we're nine years old, but I just think we're only getting started. Um, as I was saying, we were working for many years with just one engineer. Now we've 20. It's, it's amazing what you can do with 20. Uh, we're very pregnant with a lot of stuff that needs to, will be coming out this summer. Um, I'd, I'd be disappointed if we don't have 100 million learners by 2020. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities on Allison for people who are creators or publishers uh, living, working remotely. And on the whole, you, talk, you think about Alison uh, uh, in learning and free learning. I, d I don't see that. I see that the business that we're actually in is human capital management. It's taking people, making the best of them. So I hope that's been interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm.